Hello, hello. I'm starting like a minute early in hopes that my microphone is not screwing up. So hopefully it's not. And if it is, I am so, so sorry. Let me see. Hi, Meatball. Hi, Cat. Hi, Tawny C. So nice to see you. Let me see. Rebecca Shaw. Hello. And hi, Jandon. Okay, so hopefully, guys, the sound is working and we're okay. Um, hopefully, maybe whatever I'm doing now is working. Hi, Pooks. Hi, Jade Ford. Hi, Pooks. Hi, Brox. And hi, Mr. Crow. Hi, Nachiquita. Hello there. Hi, Jay Snyder. And hi, Don Lambert. And hi, Anthony Medina. Hello. This is so exciting. Thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you so much. All right. So hi, JD Lotus. Hello. Hello. So, oh man, I've got a, hi, Annie Kurtz. I have got to correct the record, but in doing so, this just got so much more interesting, guys. It's really fascinating. I'm, uh, I don't know what to say. I'm excited and not about being right or anything. I'm just excited that I really feel like we're getting closer to the truth. That excites me. Um, and quite frankly, I will state up front, I'm not here to exonerate David Berkowitz in a court of law or even necessarily in the public eye. I think that he has made his decisions. Uh, you know, I personally think that, again, you know, he has a lot to lose, not necessarily a lot to gain in maintaining his story or whatever that story is now. I'm not here to do that. However, this is a huge conspiracy a huge conspiracy on so many levels. Um, cause we're going to be talking about a few different things. Uh, and once we sort of, I explain to you guys why we're correcting something that it was an honest mistake on my part, but I'm not going to lie to you guys. Um, and this has been with the help of Virginia, seriously, uh, because this Scientology angle is a huge part of it. And it's so funny because someone had left a comment on my Twitter about how one of the letters that I think was sent into the newspaper, I could be wrong, uh, but one of the like letters that mentions fair game, this person was stating that another investigator or researcher, you know, didn't find that important and they thought that it was. And in my head, I'm like, yeah, it's like that Dave Chappelle skit where he's talking about the cops, like framing, uh, you know, framing black people, like just sprinkle some crack on them and open and shut case Johnson. Like, that's how I felt when I heard the fair game part of the letter. I was like, this is Scientology and like the process, you know what I mean? But we're going to get into it. Um, and let me make sure. Hi, Joseph Korea. I saw the process church symbol the other day. Hey, Coop Films. Where did you see it? I'm very curious. Was it on a building? Because that would be terrifying. Uh, so we are still in California. So we're going to run the same schizo clip as last time because instead it's a, it's a different person in California, but, uh, it is the car family, the ever changing mysterious car family. So here we go. Trying to make it up out the dirt Counting friends 
I lost in blue faces until my fingers hurt. Psycho dad and OG been lighting, go help me with my nerve. Bitches plotting all cause I'm popping, but fuck it, let them twerk. Don't forget, we are literally out here uh, fighting demons, y'all. Let me see. Joseph Korea, you saw it on a Disney. Well, that doesn't surprise me at all. I would love to see, like, if you can find a link or tell me what it was, because uh, that doesn't surprise me whatsoever, because the process, best friends, right now, one of their properties is registered to Disney. And hey, Echo Cat, no worries. Thank you for just dropping in and saying hi. Hello, me, Brussels Project. Let me make sure I'm not missing anybody else. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Uh, I make those myself. It's just a fun way to be creative and... I don't know, kind of slip in a little bit of propaganda. Hey, Soil Lodge. All right, let me make sure I'm not missing anything else. Okay, so I discussed with you guys the other day about uh, Mr. Michael Carr, Mr. Michael Vale Carr III, right? And I told you guys that me and Virginia were going to be discussing a bit more deeply the consideration of Michael being routed through the guardian's office possibly or coming in under the cloak of the guardian's office and then being shifted into the process yeah well virginia was looking a bit more and i was thinking too and i'm like the third well there has to be a second right and she had called me and told me she's like there has to be a second and she, so on their GoFundMe, the guy that created it for them who runs it, his name is Lauren. He is also a whistleblower that most people uh, have not heard of, or if they have, they don't talk about him because these whistleblowers don't get talked about. However, uh, so he has a lot of knowledge and experience in regards to how these training programs operate and how they operated at that time. And so we said, what was the chance, the chance of there, you know, being two Michael Cars? One is the third, because he's named the third, and I'm going to show you guys where he's named the third in a Scientology publication in an auditor magazine. But then there's another Michael Carr. Well, I had just happened to be looking through the newspaper archives and... Back in the day when they did the uh, the military draft, army draft, whatever, the lottery, they announce it in the newspapers. So guess what? Mike, uh, Sam Carr, Sam, Sam, Samuel, his first name is Michael. He's Michael Samuel Carr because I found him being drafted in the lottery in the newspaper. That's his name. His father's name is Michael Carr. So grandpa is Michael the first, dad is number two, and Michael Vale Carr is number three. So it seems that dad is the one that was out in LA at that time. Seriously. So it's kind of like thrown a wrench in everything. But makes a little bit more sense, doesn't it? Especially considering the, you know, I get that David Berkowitz said a lot of crazy things, but I mean, was Sam Carr running some sort of operation out there? Because I've already shown you guys the stuff with Francis. I've already shown you guys that Francis, that whole telephone thing was a straight up intelligence. It said covert intelligence operation in New York City at that time. And it was not the only one. So there is something very wrong here. And hello, Ivermectin. No worries. You're good. And hello, Auntie Green. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, um, it's, it's, I don't know. Is it a good catch? I don't know. I just happened to be looking through the newspapers and I'm going to show you guys like the lottery and then I'm going to show you my PowerPoint slide that I made. I'm going to show you guys in the auditor magazine because he is Michael Vale Carr III which means there's a two and there's a one and grandpa's number one, because I also have um, Sam. I want to call him Michael Dell. I also have Sam and Francis's uh, marriage certificate. Okay. So it is what it is. Um, now let me pull up. Cause I want to show you guys the lottery 
first because I was very tickled when I found it. And it's, you know, these things just kind of work out the way that they work out, right? Because I had happened to find it and then Virginia called me and she said, I think that there's a Sam too. She said, there's just no way that this makes sense that there's two Michael Carrs uh, in in the Church of Scientology at that time, right? So let me get this pulled up. This is the right one. Let me know if I get laggy. And hello, Petit Penguin. Okay, so this is March 19, 1942. And here we go. Draft lottery. Yeah, so we're obviously not going to read through all of this, but... Oh, uh, there he is. There he is. Bada boom, bada bing. Yeah. And that is the only time that I have been able to find his name listed as Michael Samuel Carr. But he's there. So whatever it is what it is, uh, you know, the fact, just the overlooking of the Scientology role in general to me really makes this stink of a massive cover up. And quite frankly, for those that don't buy into what is shown on TV as far as like fair game, all of that, suppressive people. It makes a lot of sense to me if Mr. Michael Samuel Carr II specifically was, you know, ordered to fair game his son. Because that is the reality of fair game, guys. The stuff that you see on TV and, you know, what is touted as fair game on the internet as far as YouTube and things of that nature. No. When you read Hubbard's policies, which I have, and I've shown it on here, I've read from the McClary's blog. It's destroy, death, kill. Seriously. Black PR, but also, hey, like if you're not going to come back or if it's for the greater good, which would be uh, protecting the church or protecting whatever operations going on. Yeah. Because I'm going to show you guys something else that's really crazy from uh, the late Ar Arnie Lerma specifically. Uh, where, I don't know, did him coming out with this information, is this the reason why he died afterwards? Because I think that it's really disgusting uh, that this stuff has not been talked about more. But let's go ahead and let's pull up Sam's little PowerPoint first. That way you guys can see it and you can see the marriage certificate. And hello, Samantha, if I ever go missing, I want Dana and Virginia to find me. Well, I don't want that to happen, please. Yeah, reminded me of the listening stations that are littered around the U.S. Thomas Street in New York is one. That is fascinating, Soil Lodge. Let me see. Hello, David Tooley. And in a Facebook group discussion, Wheat mentions how they had kid phone lines, so it would not interfere with the answering service. Oh, really? Well, that's, that's not suspicious at all. Because I'm going to show you guys more stuff in the newspapers because we and Michael, before Michael, uh, in my opinion, was uh, fair gamed. I'm not saying that what Arnie said isn't true. I'm just saying I think that it should be taken into consideration, even though it's extremely dark. Uh, specifically, you know... <sighs> I don't know, guys. I'm trying not to get frustrated. Let's go ahead and just take a peek. All right. So this is Mr. Uh, Michael Samuel Carr. Let me make sure you guys can see. All right. So over here, uh, let's try not to. Okay. So there we go. So that paper that I showed you guys was from, uh, I think that was March, like late March when the draft lottery came out. Yeah. So there he is showing, I mean, they even put his height and weight in here, which is kind of crazy. I couldn't find too many pictures of him, but obviously that is a photo of him with Harvey, the dog that they were trying to sell, let us not forget. And that is his marriage to uh, Francis Erlene Thompson. Yep. 
And obviously right there, yeah, March 19th, 1942 was the date of the lottery. And there is their certificate of marriage. And as you can see, literally his father's name is Michael Carr. Now, the mother's name is listed as Milhana Dizanba. Well, we're going to be looking at that too, because all of that is extremely, uh, extremely sus. I think that he put that name in incorrectly for a reason. Um, and then that's just the newspaper announcing them getting married. And this is the census in Westchester, New York, specifically. And there he is, Samuel, Francis, and John. And then I guess here, uh, 157 post-GIs swap khakis for surge. Obviously, I'm not uh, any sort of expert whatsoever on uh, like military operation, like ranking and movement at that time. I just, I found it, so I'm throwing it in, and that's how we're doing that. Now, let me see. I burnt my draft card. Well, thank you so much, Ivermectin, for catching up. Let me see. Somebody asked a question up here. Something you say, oh, okay, you guys are talking about something else. Sorry, guys wife from Arlington, Virginia. Yeah, the the stuff with, I'm trying to really do a deep dive on both sides of the family because, you know, I want to know like the whole story. Were these people just randomly selected? Because you guys have seen with the process, that was not the case, right? We were able to prove that Robert de Grimston is like black nobility. Yeah, we've been able to prove that he was de Grimston before he ever met Marianne. But it requires going backwards. And it's okay. I enjoy it. I feel like I'm putting a puzzle together. You know what I mean? Uh, and I really enjoy it. Now, let me pull up just so that you guys can see specifically because there are a few things from Michael. And one of these, if you are on my Twitter, I posted it. But it's almost like a yearbook photo from the Rochester... Ooh, I can't, it's called RIT. I'm sorry. I don't remember it off the top of my head. It doesn't matter. You guys are going to see this here. So whatever. Don't, you know, rake me over the coals for it. But here we go. Now, in regards to his hair and some of the uh, sketches, and I'm not going to sit here and do comparisons with sketches of, you know, what eyewitnesses saw. However, <laughs> that hair is a hell of a lot different than that hair. Okay. Just my two cents. But he is listed there as Michael Vale Carr III. And then later on in this uh, Rochester, well, thank you so much, Mode 85, Rochester Institute of Technology. Um, he is also listed there, uh, part of the Photo Society. And that is his address. And obviously, this is detailing the things about his accident, and it does mention his older brother, John. We've kind of gone over some of this stuff. And then this, I found the original article discussing tests being run on him. And it does mention that he was a part of the Church of Scientology. And it does say that he was the executive director for the car answering service, which I do think is kind of interesting. It may be neither here nor there. Now, right here, I'm going to show you guys what I have. Because I literally, you guys know that I'm not well versed in any of this stuff. But this individual, Howard Weiss, who they state was an acquaintance of Berkowitz, who was murdered in New York City and was friendly with a former Yonkers police officer who was acquainted with John and Wheat. I don't know if I found him. I think that I did. Uh, and I haven't been able to find too, too much outside of what I have found. Uh, but I'll show you guys. And then this was another article that was discussing, and I couldn't find the first page of it, so I don't know who wrote it. But I think that it is very interesting that there was police surveillance at Michael Carr's wake. Um, and apparently a police informant who was an associate of John Carr was run off the road in Minot, North Dakota, where John had, you know, uh, apparently taken his life. 
And it says that there was another bizarre incident in Minot three nights ago from the publication of this newspaper. A friend of John Carr, who had been questioned by the police several times recently, who almost died from a suicide attempt. So I don't know if Maury Terry wrote that, and I don't really think that everything that he said can be discredited. The more that I'm looking into this, quite frankly, <laughs> uh, I, I seriously do not think that I, we toss out his entire book straight up. Um, let me see. I'm just showing you guys what I do. This is, I'm literally highlighting everything because I'm going to show you guys. This says that Michael Carr was known to abstain from alcohol and the autopsy found that he was drunk, but there's an interview with him and Wheat before he died where he does say something different. And so I do think that that's kind of weird. Um, and let me see. This is the announcement of him again, specifically. Uh, and this mentions an interview with Francis, which Francis doesn't really show up in the papers, man. Uh, but it says that uh, her husband and daughter, Wheat, were making a final ID of the body. They know it's Michael, though. And it's like, okay, well, how do you know? That's a bold claim, in my opinion. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, am I am I being too harsh? I don't think I'm being too harsh because, you know, I I hear people saying that like they're heroes and X Y and Z. But then I'm also looking in the papers and they're kind of doing the same thing. I already showed you guys that. I showed you guys where they're trying to play that whole angle. I think that it's kind of weird. I I don't know. Uh I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm being unfair. Now, let me just go ahead and show you guys what I found for Howard Weiss, and I'm going to tell you why I think it's interesting, because I don't know if someone has positively identified Howard Weiss. However, uh, the person that matched up in the timeline as far as their death, because, you know, it says that they were murdered, well, this person was also uh, serving in Korea. So I think that that's pretty relevant with what we have going on with some of these individuals. Let me see if I can move this over. It's not going to let me. Dang it. Hold on. Uh, you know what? We're just going to zoom in on it and you guys are going to have to squeeze your eyes a little bit. Yeah, but we'll get there. It's going to be okay. All right, here we go. And bada boom, bada bing. Okay, so this is Howard W. Weiss. Uh, so he was, I don't know what that is, sergeant in the army, <laughs> um, but it says year of death, October 10th, 1980. And it does say right there that he was in Korea. I don't know if this is him, but this is the only person that I could find that it made any sense with the timeline. And like I said, I'm really not looking at other people's research. I'm not trying to uh, not only not steal from other people, but I'm also just kind of trying to follow my own instincts. Obviously, I am working with Virginia because she is incredibly knowledgeable about the Scientology aspect specifically. Um, but, you know, she's taught me to trust my instincts and it has fared me well thus far. Now, let me see who we're going to look at next. Yeah, we're going to we're going to look at because uh, there's something up with Samuel, aka Michael II's father. Uh, and I'm going to show you guys because you've already seen that really weird spelling of the mother's maiden name of Samuel Carr's mother's maiden name. And we're going to see a trend of all these different spellings. And so I literally have no idea who these people are. I would like to know, but I just don't know. Let me see. Yeah, his hair was definitely uh, different. Matched quite a few of the sketches, if you ask me, but uh, I don't want to sit here and do that. I know that there's a lot of people who spend time doing it. Dana, when searching for the truth about Scientology, I found the McClary's blog and Arnie Lerma's site to be the most informative. Yeah, I, I haven't really looked at Arnie Lerma's stuff, but, you know, that was what Virginia brought to my attention. And I... Like I said, I think that everything deserves to be looked at critically, especially in the, uh, what are we in, 2023, the year is almost over, this year of our Lord, where, you know, these ex-Scientologists are acting like you getting a side eye at 7-Eleven or somebody following you two turns on the highway is the equivalent of fair game. Okay. 
Let me see. Hey, Forensics of Evil. Howard Weiss is still a mystery, but we know a lot more about him now. Francis Carr knew to stay away from the bright lights. Yeah, I think it's interesting, Forensics, that, you know, she really wasn't shy in the beginning. She's at the Soroptimus Club. And she's taking pictures and she's talking about her answering service. And then she just disappears. I would like to know where she went. You know what I mean? Obviously, I have my suspicions, but I will keep those to myself for now. Sam the Surveillance Rabbit. Let me see. I found Howard Weiss on Long Island. He was murdered by one of his employees. That's interesting. I don't... That didn't give a cause of death. So, obviously, when I don't see a cause of death, it concerns me to an extent. You know what I mean? Let me see. There was also a Sam Carr who was a Soviet spy in Canada in the early 50s just cleared that up. Well, that's interesting. I personally, like I said, I mean, when I was talking to uh, Virginia about it, it didn't make sense that there were two Michael Cars, And I'm going to show you guys Michael Carr in the Auditor magazine, where he is identified as Michael Carr III. And she said the church would not identify him as such unless there was another one. And there was a, it was a family member period. <laughs> so, you know, obviously that's them. That's them. Until, until there's proof otherwise, that's them, which means literally that Sam was in LA going clear in 68. Okay. That means that all that stuff that I read to you guys from the last time about, like, the success story that I said was giving off, like, major spook energy, like, I just got back from uh, the farm and intelligence training is great and everybody should do it. You'll be very disciplined. Yeah? I mean, that's literally the energy that it gives off. But now it makes even more sense if it's coming from Sam because now he's just Sam to me. But let me show you guys what I found for the dad. Now, this looks like a mess, but you're going to see why. Because you're going to see these weird spellings of these names of the mom. Because the spelling is weird, and their other kid spells her name differently too, and I don't know why. Like, I, I seriously don't know why. I feel like they're trying to throw people off of the scent. Now, let me make sure. Okay, so this one right here I feel pretty confident about. So this is uh, obviously going to be, you know, grandpa car. Uh, but this is the naturalization record, specifically in Brooklyn, right there, April 13th, 1901. And it says, I believe that he is 23 years old. Now, over here, and on Sam and Francis's marriage license, it says that the family that they came from Austria so this matches, but see right here, her name is spelled Micheline. So I don't know. I'm just showing you guys what I found because this death record specifically says Michael Korch Carr. I don't know who Korch is. I have no idea. But right here, there they are again. Michael, Micheline. Austrian. Austrian. And Andrew is one of his siblings. And Sam is right there. Sam. It's really hard to read. But there's little Sam. And then down here again. Austria. I don't know. This is the only obituary that I could find that matched up with this. But it says Michael Korch Carr. It doesn't give the name of his widow. Why doesn't it give the name of his widow? It says that he was a highly respected resident of, what is this, White or Plains. Sorry. Yeah, I cut off part of this. Uh, but it says he is survived by his widow. Doesn't give a name. Why? That's weird to me. Now, over here, this obviously is just detailing in the right corner. I can't get it to zoom in. So on Ancestry, it'll just kind of break down what it is so the naturalization petition now over here if i could get this freaking thing to work thank you in another place because 
right there, Michelina Jamba. Jamba is the name that they put on that marriage record for Sam and Francis. They spell it a little bit differently, but that is the same last name. I'm sorry if this sounds stupid or confusing, guys, but these things are relevant to me because it says that her youngest son's name was Sam. They're also from Austria. Her last name is this weird, you know, Jamba. I'm not hating on anybody with the last name Jamba. However, that is on the marriage records. These kids are putting those on the marriage records. It just doesn't make sense, guys. This, the fact that this is this difficult to determine, it doesn't make sense. And it just doesn't. So now I'm going to show you guys specifically one of, uh, Samuel, Michael, whatever, one of his siblings, where you're going to see that they spell it differently again and they put a different first name because uh, it's not just one person. So to me, this is them trying to cover up their tracks. Okay. So right here, full name, Andrew Carr. I love, I'm assuming that he was, uh, I don't know, like cut trees for a living, but his occupation is a tree surgeon. I just think that that's so much fun. However, uh, groom's father's name, Michael Carr. And then look right there, maiden name of groom's mother, Helen Jambo, both from Austria. Sorry, this does not make sense. And it just doesn't. Because see, right there, it shows up as Milhenna Jamba. Michael Carr. That doesn't make sense. That dog don't hunt. Why are they not putting in the right name? I don't chalk all of that up to just, you know, uh, a silly, a silly sort of mistake. And I just don't. I'm sorry. That's a very unique and identifying name specifically. Very identifying. And if it's Corch or Czar or Zam, I don't know. I don't know. But this is what I found so far. I first met Arnie Lerma in the Dave McGowan Facebook group. Only spoke to him a few times, but I was shocked and sad in learning about what happened to him. Oh, well, Soil Lodge, if you have questions, uh, we can come on and talk about that someday because I have a pretty good idea of what happened. Let me see. It is a haystack of hilarious proportions in regards to multiple cars and yonkers. Yeah, it really is. It really is. But I'm glad that I found Sam, especially being drafted in that lotto because now I know that he's Michael too. Let me see. Micheline is weak car's middle. Shut up. No, it's not. Are you guys serious? Are, <laughs> Are you guys serious right now that Micheline is weak car's middle name? Is that why I saw in some weird Twitter post? Uh, Mickey wheat car. Are you serious? So I am looking at the right stuff. I'm looking at the right stuff. They're just making it confusing as hell. What the hell? They would have hidden their Austrian connections during the Great War. That is such a great point, Ivermectin. I couldn't find the BBC documentary, but there is still stuff to look at. Thank you so much, Tawny C. I appreciate it. Let me see. I'm not... Uh, sorry, I'm not trying to, like, ignore anybody. I just also don't want to get lost in reading all of the chat. Uh, let me see. Pretty sure. The Carr family attended the same church that a lot of escaped Ukrainian Nazis of the 14th SS Division. I think, oh, well, <clears throat> I would be happy to talk about that because that's quite fascinating because, uh, you know, I, while I don't like Nazis, I do enjoy uh, history specifically and that kind of history is very fascinating to me. Now, before we move on in the newspapers with the ever-changing stories of wheat, let me pull up the, this is, it's going to get laggy, guys. 
Let me go to the first page so you can see the cover of the Auditor magazine so we can look at this. And then I'm going to show you Michael Vale card the third. That way you guys can see it with your own eyes, okay? So this is the Auditor 152 Worldwide. Right there. Look at Hubbard. I wonder what he's doing. Yeah. What's he doing? Applying the philosophy. That's what he's doing. Now, I'm going to skip down. Okay. Whoop. Sorry, guys. And if I get laggy, my bad. However, let's go. This picture taken by Michael Carr III, clear number 8,963. So now we have confirmed the first Michael Carr was whatever that clear number was, one, zero, whatever. I'll go back and pull it up. But Michael Carr III, yeah? Is it really a stretch when he is at the Rochester, uh, whatever, Technical Institute? Uh, Institute of Technology, where it says specifically that he's in a photography class. Yeah. And Virginia's working on figuring out if these individuals in these photos were in the Guardian's office at that time. Because those types of things are very relevant. Because if these are the spooks of the church, then that means that the younger car... Uh, he wasn't just taking photos for fun because, you know, yes, like L. Ron Hubbard was, you know, a narcissist. However, I tell you guys, I give the man credit where it is due. He has and is still running the most successful intelligence operation of all time. And someone's not going to be in those early auditor magazines where their pictures are being put in their pictures that they've taken if he wasn't an important person and if his father wasn't an important person, quite frankly. Um, now let me see. Sorry guys. My, my Cola Labed lived in Yonkers and ran an operation out of Manhattan for decades based Lutheranism. Tree surgeon. They didn't call that job arborist. Pretty uppity. I think tree surgeon is super fun. I think it's like, uh, I don't know. It just, Gave me a fun visual in my mind, but I, yeah, I thought it was a little bit extra. Let me see. Wow, 79, April 1979, one month later, I'm in the hospital headquarters for Kodak. Let me see. Those Azov Waffen cats. Yeah, well, you know, I'm going to show you guys because I just thought that it was uh, really fun. And I say fun in a semi-ironic way. However, for those of you that are familiar with the Franklin scandal and uh, Lawrence King, I would like to share with you a fascinating newspaper that I found. Uh, just really did it for me. Putting everything into perspective. Yeah. So here is the Omaha World Herald, September 22nd, 1977. Ordeal not over for family in the Son of Sam case. Yeah. Now, what else is very fascinating, because I'm going to show you guys another article, but there is something that old Wheat leaves out of this interview. But this is discussing David Berkowitz's arrest, and it's the first time that Sam is going out. I want to know who the hell he went to the Kiwanis Club luncheon with, because none of these papers name who he went with. And I can't find any pictures, but, you know, they keep stressing that this is the first time that he is going out and blah, 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 blah. Okay, well, who in the hell did he go out with? Yeah, that's what I want to know. Uh, but then it's also talking about the fifteen dollars to $20,000 that they were demanding, remember? But now, now they're saying that they had been instructed by their attorney to discourage the press. Okay, well, I'm also going to show you why that's a crock of shit. Excuse my language. Um, and then let me see. Over here. They leave some really interesting things out of this interview that you're going to see in other publications. And because it's the Omaha World Herald, it just 
kind of tickled me a bit. The car said they had received support from many friends and from the Yonkers PD, which maintained a guard at their house for three weeks after the threatening letters and calls began coming in. But there were some acquaintances who just couldn't leave it alone, said Michael. I went into a bar that I frequent shortly after the arrest, said the younger car, and they just couldn't resist introducing me as the real son of Sam. It was a bad joke. Car, 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 car. Wheat. I would like to know, has anybody seen, and this is a serious question, uh, the copious notes on the letters and events of the preceding months? Has anybody seen those? I'm just curious. Because those Son of Sam files are huge. I mean, they're literally huge. And some of them are just like, it, you can tell somebody's scanning as quick as they can. And so it's like a hand, you know, it's, I'm trying to get through the newspapers and get everything I can. Has anybody seen Wheat's notes? She was trying to make sense of everything. Yeah. How about that one in a million chance that you were the dispatcher that got the call? Have you made sense of that? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I, I have nothing, I have nothing nice to say, so I should probably just shut my mouth about the topic. Now, let me find the other paper that they give a little bit of a more detailed, semi-different story, uh, cause I think it's really fascinating. And these are back to back. I think this one is a little bit clearer. Let me catch up with the chat really quick. Let me see. Uh, I want to make a tickle joke, but I won't. I don't know about what. Tree surgeon is what we call it in the UK. Oh, JD Lotus, that's very interesting. Really? Huh. That's fascinating. Thank you. I would have never known that. Well, well, well. That just makes it even more, uh, I don't know. I have to laugh or else I'm going to cry. So I knew a tree surgeon during the Dutch elm disease problem in the 70s when a lot of trees had to be burned. He was a bit crazy. I mean, whatever made the trees sick, if they were burning them, maybe it made him sick too. I'm going to need to watch a lot of comedy specials after this series is completed. Such heavy stuff. Yeah, Danny Crook. I mean, we're, we're barely scratching the surface. We're barely scratching the surface here. I know that John Carr attended Kant's Kinesius College in Buffalo for a short while. That place is a Jesuit institution. Ooh, forensics of evil. I'm so glad that you pointed that out. I have something else I need to show you guys. Let me see. It was a one in a billion chance that I found you. Well, thanks, Gia. I'm glad that you're here. They had an uncle from another prominent Yonkers family living in Buffalo, not far from Rochester. Yeah, these people are plugged in. They're plugged in on another level. Uh, this whole, they're heroes and they were victims. Like, it's insulting to me when I'm reading these newspapers and Wheat is saying, like, we're the equivalent of the victims who actually died or were harmed. No, you're not. No, you're not. Because it's going to take us a really long time to get through all of this, guys. Uh, but no, you're not. Because obviously I'm not going to sit here for hours and hours and bore everybody. However... You know, there's a lot of other very questionable things with this family in particular. Now, in regards to the uh, Jesuit college. So, I had shown you guys last time, and I'm going to pull the slide back up. I have not been able to identify too much, but you guys are literally going to see how my brain operates. So, the process buys the uh, Pound Ridge estate, right? And it lists the name of the woman that they bought it from. And I said, okay, well, obviously I need to see who she is. So I did. Now, you guys will remember that I also showed not that long afterwards that their uh, religious center was vandalized by someone who was a uh, militant member of the Jewish Defense League. That's their words. We're going to read it. I'm going to show you the the previous owner of Pound Ridge Estate, who their family is, and you guys tell me that this was not uh, like a pre-calculated move. 
Because I think that it was straight up. I think that this was a pre-calculated move to get the process out and to also make it appear like the process was uh, being persecuted. Because let's not forget, guys, it's well established that the process were Nazis. They were Nazi sympathizers. We've literally read stuff in those court records about it. And then they have the audacity to turn around and say that they consider themselves Jewish. Yeah, they did. I've already gone over that. We're not going to sit here and read all of that crap again. But, okay, so right here. So there she is. So Fripp bought the property from Lillian Addis of Brooklyn in 1973. And right here, 1977, again, I think the timing is fascinating because of the Molotov cocktail that they say David Berkowitz uh, threw through their window. However... So right here, windows are broken. They got a call from a member of the militant Jewish Defense League claiming responsibility for the vandalism to stop the organizations from trying to impose their beliefs on the Jewish people. Okay, so that's all good and well. That's fine. I don't play identity politics, however. Uh, and I'm having a real tough time finding this dude's legitimate name, which is kind of driving me nuts. But is telling me like my spotty senses are saying that there's a reason. However, this is all I can find. So her brother was Mickey Block, member of the James Platt Post. He was vice president of Peck Hills Furniture Company in New York and vice president of Omega Furniture in Miami. He was president of the congregation Talmud Torah Adarath L in New York City and a member of the Lieutenant James Platt Post of the Jewish War Veterans. His sister was Lillian Addis of Brooklyn, okay? So that doesn't really make sense to me that that's who Christopher Fripp bought that property from. And then their church, I understand it wasn't the Pound Ridge estate, but that literally their church is getting uh, vandalized a year later. Sorry, don't buy it. Seems like a setup. It seems like they're starting to set up some kind of narrative. I don't care if people think that that's crazy or conspiratorial thinking. Uh, I think that it's really crazy that people think that Berkowitz did this by himself. Can I come out and say that? And, you know, uh, people not think that, like, I'm a complete moron? I mean, seriously. Oh. Oh, let's find the stuff where Wheat's talking about dating David Berkowitz and she doesn't deny it. Bear with me for one moment, because when I found this, I said, oh, Wheat, honey, you didn't deny it. You didn't deny it. So, did you? I don't know. Because, you know, now that I'm looking at all of this, in the perspective of Scientology, the process, ex-Scientology... No, I am most definitely not an expert, and I don't want to be. It's very confusing. However, I have learned that it's in what they don't say. That says so much. Truly. Because of the way that Scientology operates and the way that they are trained. Specifically. So she didn't deny it. Did she deny it later? I don't know, but let's look at a couple of things because these are two articles like I showed you last time. They're very similar. They're pumped out by the press pretty much back to back. Uh, and, you know, they don't want any money. They're victims. Right? They're victims. Yeah, they've suffered just like the real victims who died or were shot. So right here, this is from May 9th, 1978, Sam Carr with Wheat and the dog Harvey in Yonkers. Yeah? So. Yonkers police in New York investigating officers were initially so suspicious that Carr might actually be an accomplice that we had to hire a lawyer. Yeah? I... Jesus. Wheat had to quit her job as a Yonkers PD civilian dispatcher to help her parents deal with the switchboard of their answering service business, which was tied up with abusive or curious callers. 
Wheat's brother John committed suicide in North Dakota because she said he had marital problems. Is that why Wheat? Hmm? Up here. So talking about the beginning of Berkowitz's alleged campaign starting in April of 1976, they said that Harvey was shot in 77. Now, I think it is completely freaking insane. The police could prove nothing, but the cars tabbed him as a Sam suspect in June 1977, but no one would listen, Wheat said. Damn, Wheat seems to have a lot of knowledge, doesn't she? Crazy. So the famous parking ticket that led to his arrest got Wheat Car on the phone at Yonkers Police Headquarters by a one in a million chance. The cars feel the information they gave on Berkowitz entitles them to part of the $15,000 reward. They feel they have been his victims and hope to write a book about their experiences. Wheat says this will not be for profit, that they will contribute proceeds to the Crime Victims Fund. We're the perfect example of the victims getting nothing but publicity. Really. Really. Yeah? Okay, Wheat. Whatever you say. I don't... I have no idea. Well, I have an idea. I'm not going to say what the idea is. Um, because whatever. I, I would imagine that these people are quite lawsuit happy. Uh, however, has anyone seen the, the, the paperwork from Wheat? Has anybody seen it? This is a question that, you know, I would allow uh, someone else to kind of uh, like dictate to me as far as if they've seen it, if it exists. I'm going to show you guys another employee of the uh, car answering service who I had never heard of. Not in the files that I saw. Could have overlooked it. She was very young when she died and she died around the time of all of this crap. And I would like to know what happened to her too because she was really young. And I can't find anything on her and I think that that's really sad. So Janet Kagana, she was 33, a lifelong Yonkers resident, died at her home. So right here, she was employed by the car answering service for the last two years. Yeah. And there she is. She was very young. Who the hell is she? And there's her, uh, you know, husband, her surviving husband. Apparently he was a master sergeant, <laughs> you know, and he was some big wig in New York City. Concurrent with his military service, he was employed by the Metropolitan Museum of Art in Manhattan for many years. He joined the Navy in 1952 and was stationed in Japan for four years. Afterwards, he became a member of the Air Force and the National Guard. And he retired shortly after her death. No idea to how he died. And this is him in a protest. I kind of thought that it was funny. Uh, we'll guard the mummies, but we won't lead a mummy's life. We want a contract. So that was him picketing on behalf of the museum. I love old newspapers and uh, yeah. Uh, I don't know if anybody has ever heard of her. But the wheat car was still around. So was Sam. So what the hell? Who is she? And what happened to her? I would like to know. I don't know. There's just, there's a lot of like random sort of on the fringes deaths. And like these random names. But then these random people still are tied to someone suspicious. Like her old man. I'm sorry, you're suspicious. That period of wartime, you are suspicious. You are a suspect to me. I'm sorry. It is what it is. Let me see. Maury told me he knew about Wheat's travels to Idaho in the early 70s. Well, the Idaho visit was probably related to the National Renaissance Party. I bet you that old Wheat was flirty fishing. Yeah, well, uh, quite frankly, I don't put anything past her, uh, and I, I don't feel bad for her 
I'm certainly like not scared of her. Uh, I, I don't care. I really don't. I don't care. I'm literally reading these people's words and I'm going to find this stupid paper because it's in here. I don't remember where I put it, where she's talking about dating Berkowitz and she doesn't deny it. Let me see. Yeah, I found it. Okay, let me see. Where is the police report for the fire bombing? That's a great question, Soil Lodge. I don't know. I haven't like looked through all of the police reports because of the shootings. There's, they're so long. They're so long. And people want to sit here and argue about forensics and da, 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 da. And I'm like, I don't care. I already told you guys, I don't care. The deeper that I look into this, the more that I don't believe. And I think it's quite frankly, uh, excuse my language, fucking silly for people to think that David Berkowitz did this by himself. Am I saying that he's a complete victim? No, because he is making certain choices. I'm not saying that the situation that he's in or has been in is not challenging. However, this is a massive conspiracy. And the Church of Scientology and the Process Church of the Final Judgment are involved in a big way. And the people that want to deny that, in my opinion, they're compromised. Let me see. Pretty odd months of harassment and a police dispatcher wasn't able to get any traction from the police. Yeah, well, I think it's real weird that Wheat was holding on to one of those letters. You know, it just, uh, she thought for whatever reason that she has the authority to hold on to one of the Berkowitz letters. For like, what, over a week it said last time we read? Okay, who the hell are you? Seriously. Unless, <laughs> unless, because again, I would like to know, uh, has, if anyone has seen her uh, copious amounts of notes, that's fine. But I'm super curious to see those because people love coming on here and doing these silly handwriting analysis. What do Wheat's notes look like? Yeah? Let me see. Literally temple prostitution or Hoenn for Jesus. Shut up. Let me see. Metropolitan Museum of Art is a red flag. Hell yeah, Forensics of Evil. I thought that it was a red flag too. I'm like, oh, so you're just like a master sergeant, but then you're also working at uh, the museum. Okay, sure. Let me see. They had a lot of employees who came and went. A friend of mine even did renovation work on 316 Warburton. Plenty of other guys did. Somebody sent me this really fascinating uh, newspaper article where Wheat, I, I think it was just Wheat, but like she sold that house to some super sus dude for like $15,000. Okay, whatever you say. Uh, so let's go ahead and pull up this other article because I know that this one pops up when you kind of Google Son of Sam, any of the cars. Uh, but I found the original because I prefer the original from the newspaper archives. I feel like the ones that are on some of the other blog sites, they're too contrasted. It, I can't tell if someone messed with them or not. I'm not accusing anyone of doing so, but I'm just, I want to see it for myself from the newspaper archives so I know where I'm getting it. So right here... Yeah. So the car said that they had gotten support from many friends who were kind enough not to question them about the case and from the Yonkers PD, which maintained a guard at the house for three weeks after the threatening letters and calls began coming in. And again, Michael Carr, I went into a bar that I frequent shortly after the arrest, who is a freelance advertising stylist, and they just couldn't resist introducing me as the real son of Sam. It was a bad joke. Miss Carr, growing angry as her brother recounted his problems, said people had told her that they had heard that she dated Berkowitz and asked her if it was true. She doesn't deny it. She literally does not deny it. In spite of their insistence that they want to forget their ordeal, the cars conceded a certain gnawing about the case. Miss Carr said she had made copious notes on the letters and events of the preceding months, trying to make sen some sense of the whole thing. That anguish, Miss Carr said, makes them victims of the son of Sam suspect, just as the families of those whom he allegedly killed or maimed as victims. That is a bold fucking claim, Wheat. Excuse my language. That is a bold claim. 
And right here, here it is again in another paper. Yeah. She does not deny it. <laughs> she doesn't deny it. Why? Did she? I don't know. Do I really care about like her personal life? Like her, her intimate life? Do I care about David Berkowitz's intimate life? No, not really. I really don't. However, uh, you know, it's becoming more and more obvious by the day because now, you know, I have to sit here and, and I'm not acting like I'm doing anybody a favor. I'm just saying in my frustration, having to kind of recalculate the timeline, because now I am of the full belief that it was not Michael Carr III, it was Michael Carr II, aka Michael Samuel Carr, who was uh, going clear right before Heber Gench, which means that Sam was in LA when the Manson stuff was going on, when the Process Church of the Final Judgment was in LA, and again, Heber Gench, because we cannot leave Heber out because Heber's still coming, guys. Because unfortunately, yes, all of this stuff does tie in together. It does. I don't care if people don't like it. I don't care if they think that it's conspiratorial. Because when you're not sitting here just reading police reports and interviewing people who definitely have nothing to lose or gain by uh, spitting out a certain narrative, then you see within the bigger picture all of the things that are going on. Because it, And it's something that I had been thinking about, and Virginia brought it up as well. Everybody needs to keep in mind what else was going on. At the time, with the Church of Scientology, Operation Snow White, yeah? And I've already told you guys, Operation Snow White straight up is, uh, you know, a red herring. But now, now, <laughs> I will tell you guys my, like, uh, full-blown, like, a uh, little noited thought about this. I, I straight up think that Operation Snow White was a distraction from the Son of Sam stuff now. Sorry. I've told you guys that Snow White was like garbage from the beginning. And Mike McClary agrees. And he was former Guardian's office who literally was a part of Operation Snow White. I'm not saying he agrees about the Son of Sam stuff, but he agrees that it was a red herring. He was there. Because he knew what else was going on outside of the church, especially in the anti-cult movement. Because in regards to the, uh, you know, firebombing, Molotov cocktails, whatever, at the process uh, location, specifically in New York, that rabbi that I had mentioned last time, well, that rabbi was also involved. I've tied him in with Dr. Margaret Singer. Yeah. And her early anti-cult activities in New York City. So I think it's super duper interesting that that guy is running around in the newspapers uh, talking about, we got to take down the Moonies. We got to take down the Unification Church. Yeah. And he's literally working with Dr. Margaret Singer who will later join the False Memory Syndrome Foundation Scientific Advisory Board. So do you understand what I mean about it's all connected? Because it is all connected. Uh, I just, I don't really know another way to put it without completely ripping my hair out. Let me see. Wheat likes to fall back into grief and anguish mode when people start asking questions. Yeah, well, uh, I'm just going to keep it 100, uh, like tough shit. <laughs> Seriously, I'm not going to reach out and ask her any questions because, quite frankly, I don't think that she's a believable or trustworthy person. Uh, and I think that the newspapers alone have shown that. However, uh, you know, <laughs> did you know that your father was in L.A.? Did you know that your father had went clear in the 60s, very close to the time of the Manson crimes? Do you know who Heber Gench is? Because Sam was in the service. So now it makes a hell of a lot more sense to me if Sam is going clear in L.A. at the uh, advanced organization in L.A. in 68. Because Sam is going to be able to move a lot more freely with that kind of access. And we have already shown 
Francis literally working with a counterintelligence operation specifically through that answering service. So uh, what, are, what are you hiding from? Seriously. I'm not judge, jury, and executioner, and I'm not calling anybody a criminal. But I, I don't care. I don't sympathize. This has gone on long enough. And I feel very, very bad for the people that have been looking into this for such a long time. And I am very grateful for the McClaries because uh, I will be honest with you guys. I would not know to look in the old auditor magazines. That would have never crossed my mind. There are other ex... I'm not an ex-Scientologist, but as outside of the McClaries, there are plenty of other ex-Scientologists out here that are on YouTube and social media who should have known. So why didn't they? Especially some of these authors of ex-Scientology who had the audacity a couple of weeks ago to, uh, you know, continue their little campaign against Tom O'Neill and the book Chaos, but then also brought up the ultimate evil. And I thought it was really interesting, you know, that they just uh, kind of ignored uh, literally everything that I've just talked about. Why didn't John Atak look in the old auditor magazines for the cars? Hmm? Is it that difficult to uh, look back and try to trace people's birth records? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm broke. Like I'm a bum. You guys know, like what I have going on. However, I can, I can set aside some pennies every single month to have access to this because it's super important and it's not that hard once you get the hang of it. So you want to sit there and call yourself, um, an esteemed researcer, an esteemed author, an authority on something. Why am I coming here out of the woodwork? You know, just this hillbilly in the woods, this stupid hillbilly and I'm able to tie all of these things together. And I don't claim to be an authority on anything. And I tell you guys to question me, to question authority, and to question everyone. But these people who have this, like, unwarranted, in my opinion, uh, you know, high amount of confidence, uh, cockiness, narcissism, whatever the hell you want to call it, I think that that term is very overused. Why didn't you guys figure this out? Seriously. At this point, it seems like a continuing conspiracy. For the man that had red box documents since the 80s, why weren't you looking into this angle either? Because he says that the Church of Scientology, John A. Tack said it. He said it. He said that the church was also worried about the son of Sam crimes. And he said that there's record of it. So now we have the Church of Scientology, Mary Sue Hubbard and L. Ron Hubbard. More worried about the bad PR from Manson than the squirrel group, the suppressive people, even though they're not having fair game run on them of the Process Church of the Final Judgment in 68, 69, in the early 70s. And then we have the Son of Sam crime shortly thereafter. And we have two, at a bare minimum, two members of the Carr family who are Scientologists. One who was in L.A. with Manson. Because I'll say that. I don't give a damn. It's a small world. And it would be really stupid for people to think that they are not all running in the same circles in LA back in 68. Sorry. So we have this going on and the church has apparently, because people don't put out this paperwork for others to see because they like to gatekeep information because they think that it's their right. I think that it's them uh, trying to maintain their relevance and also profit off of other people's pain and hide the truth for whatever reason. However, this is now two massive, massive, just straight up like domestic terrorism operations being sanctioned, in my opinion, by the Church of Scientology. Straight up. 
and quite frankly, <laughs> by our federal government as well, because, you know, with Operation Snow White going on, uh, I think that people, you're being willfully ignorant or woefully naive if you think that the government was not aware of what was going on, especially if they were investigating them that deeply. This is just disgusting to me. I'm disgusted at the people that, you know, claim to, you know, have such a grasp on this and they're very disrespectful to everybody else and their way, it's their way or the highway. No, it's not. Because I didn't want to come into this like simping for Maury Terry. You know what I mean? He's a human being. We're all flawed. But I told you guys, that book, like the original copy of that book, I enjoyed reading it. And I thought he did a good job. And I thought that he did the best that he could with the information that he had at the time. I... I'm starting to agree with him more and more as I'm looking through this. I'm not here to exonerate him in the court of public opinion. But I'm also not going to rake him over the coals because he's dead and he cannot defend himself. I'm not denying that people maybe had bad experiences with him before his passing. Uh, quite frankly, I don't blame him for completely losing his mind. Seriously, I don't. Because I'm like, why are we looking at anybody else besides the Carr family? Seriously, why? I would like to know why. Because I feel like a lot of the answers are locked within the Carr family. And specifically, I think that Wheat has answers to a lot of it. Because that whole one in a million shot of, uh, you know her answering the phone. And I told you guys, and I will repeat it again and again, because people have told me that she is watching this and that sometimes she's in my chat. I don't care. I told you guys the first time that I read that book, I said, what's up with the sister answering the phone? That's weird. It's weird. Real weird. Super sus. Now, I am going to show you guys, and again, this is not the gospel. This is something that I think that we need to look at very critically. But I think that in the grand scheme of things, especially with what happened to this man very shortly afterwards within this timeline, and we're not going to really go into it today. I would like you all to consider critically what Arnie Lerma had to say about what happened to Michael Carr. And again, the whole uh, Leah Ramini, who has the Process Church of the Final Judgment, a.k.a. the Best Friends Animal Society, still listed as an approved charity on her website. She has blocked me. Yeah. However, <laughs> her show and all of that crap, they can sit there and say that it's fair game and she can blame the shortcomings of her career on the Church of Scientology and the Office of Special Affairs, whatever, OSA, blah, 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 right? But real fair game, real fair game, where you're homeless, killed, put into situations that are life or death, not getting looked at sideways or followed by somebody in like a black SUV who's maybe holding up a camera, maybe not, I don't know. I would like you all to consider what Arnie Lerma had to say because the individual that this conversation is had with, I believe, I want to make sure, eventually... And this is eventually, because I've known who this person is for quite some time. And some of you guys might actually know who this person is. <clears throat> the person involved in this conversation is a dangerous man. And he is a dangerous man. And I'm not saying that dramatically. Uh <laughs> There are horror stories, some of them which you can read on the McClary's blog right now. 
And, you know, I think, uh, thank you so much, Annie Kurtz. I appreciate that. Thank you. That's very kind. Um, you know, I have uh, attempted to put out some, I mean, really just the Macquarie's blog, but that this individual, uh, you know, has a repeated sort of history of trying to target and infiltrate vulnerable groups, especially uh, like monarch recovery groups. I don't care if people think that the monarch program is real. I do believe that it's real. Uh, I think that it is very conspiratorial for a reason. I don't believe every single person that says that they were a part of it. I think that it's a very heavy grifting sort of, uh, it's an area ripe for grifting and ripe for people to come in because there are people that are really vulnerable. And that's what pisses me off. But you can see this guy in interviews with some of these communities. And so I don't like it. How, and that's my opinion. I'm allowed to have it. Do whatever you're going to do, bro. I really don't care. Um, but let's go ahead and let's just take a peek. I'm going to show you the blog as is. Okay. So right here. This is from Arnie Lerma's blog. Okay. Okay. And I'm assuming that these are uh, Facebook chats. Yeah. So July 22nd, 2016, talking about revelations about the attorney and partner of Mr. Tony Ortega. There are some people who like direct me to Tony Ortega on Twitter. I'm not being disrespectful, but literally every single person involved in the ex-Scientology community that is a known face, I don't think that they're a trustworthy person, and that includes Mr. Ortega. That is my personal opinion. Some people want to call it controlled opposition. Whatever. That's fine. However, they're talking about uh, Scott Pilutic or Pilutic, whatever. Anyways, so right here. But those details will give context and perspective to Ortega. Also, the guy advising Ortega was at Howie Rohrer's mission for a few months around the time of Son of Sam and knows Michael Carr, who was ordered to do an EOC and drove his car into a telephone pole at 70 miles an hour. The guy, Scott Paludic, advising Tony Ortega, was at Howie Rohrer's mission, Scientology mission, for a few months around the time of Son of Sam, knew Michael Carr, who was ordered to do an end of cycle, aka a suicide order to be carried out for the benefit of the group, and drove his car into a telephone pole at 70 miles an hour. And right here. Satanic groups, cults, etc. are just a sure story, so homicide detectives will stop investigating. Scientology is mentioned 30 times in Maury Terry's book about Son of Sam. Son of Sam had the telco number for Flagland Base in his pocket the day he was arrested. Carr was pals with Pulitik. So it doesn't matter what the crowd thinks. The people that matter know the truth. Thank you very much, Jay Snyder. I appreciate that. Thank you. But I'm not here to tell you guys that that is, you know, 100% the truth. But I do think that it is important to consider. Because, yes, it is for the greater good. The Black Widow art dealer provocateur has said repeatedly, and there's a lot of people in the X community right now that say it too, the greater good. They still say it because they're still Scientologists in my opinion, and that is from personal experience with these people. I think that some of them are processians, including, uh, you know, Miss Claw Nails, uh, you know, who thinks that she's big and bad because she can do like an East Coast accent, right? Uh, I think that she's a full-blown processian. I think that a few of them are. However, I think that that is something to consider because that makes sense to me in a way. I don't know why it said that Michael was known to abstain from alcohol, but then in an interview with Wheat and Sam, he's talking about a bar that he frequented. 
and then he's found with alcohol in his system. Now, obviously, I would imagine if you were given that order, you might want to smooth the edges a little bit. Yeah, you might be a little bit nervous. So that part makes sense to me. But if it's a bar that he frequented, I mean, was he sober? He was young. That would be really difficult. But in Scientology, especially if he's clear, then he does have to remain sober. Supposed to, right? So I don't know. I really don't know. Let me see. I mean, I don't necessarily think that it's a smoking gun. I just think that it's something valid to consider. But I don't buy that the uh, one continuous present person, one in a million chance, I don't buy that they don't know this stuff and more, quite frankly. Let me see. Yeah, I mean, I believe that the Monarch program is real, Anthony Medina, 110%. I just, I know that that is a very vulnerable crowd. And I think that it is ripe for manipulation and for people coming in and saying something or pretending to be something or that they went through something to garner attention. But there's a lot of victim communities like that. But, you know... Uh, I am most certain that I will be hearing from that individual at some point because that dude is, uh, like I said, he is extremely dangerous because Arnie died not that long after that conversation from what I understand. Let me see. I wonder if Maury, Terry, and Estelle Myers, they both had the same boss, Rupert Murdoch. Yeah, yeah, yes, they did. Yes, they did, forensics. That's the lady that I told you guys about that she's going with the dolphins and uh, trying to get Princess Diana before she died. She's like, Princess Diana's definitely going to have a baby underwater. Uh, babies need to talk to dolphins. Dur, 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 dur. And I'm like, okay, what the hell is wrong with this chick? He didn't have to look for far for process church connections when the Son of Sam killings were going on. No, he literally didn't. He literally didn't. And like I said, I think that that whole fire going on in their uh, New York headquarters specifically that he bought from uh, whatever her name was. I can't even remember right now. Lillian Addies. You know, her brother is high up in that Jewish temple, whatever. Sorry, guys. I don't know all the names of it. And I'm not trying to be disrespectful and say the wrong thing. However, that seems like a whole setup with that narrative. Because that's right around the same time that the cars are apparently having Molotov cocktails chucked at their house by David Berkowitz. <laughs> okay. All right. Sure. Makes sense to me. Let me see. You not gonna read all... Oh, well, it's all good. What do you mean, Jay Snyder? Oh, your thing. I'm sorry. Yes, I will read it. I'm sorry. As we know, MK Project 84 researched churches, cults, and religious experiences. Now, to utilize that research, you have to make a cult and got to protect it and use it as cover to traffic people and drugs. Yes, that is correct. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, it's the truth. That's the truth in my opinion. I couldn't agree more. Let me see. Hey, Fire Pixie, and hello, Hypatia. It's the court. It's the constellation of preacher healing groups attached to evangelical groups that connect to Jewish groups that loop right back to satanic groups. There's a lot of dots to connect. Yes, yeah, a red herring factory indeed. There are a lot of dots to connect. Yeah, it's unfortunate, guys. It is what it is. Uh, God, we've got a long way to go, man. We've got a long way to go because that stuff with do Lawrence, Blair Lawrence, that stuff with Blair Lawrence and the transactional analysis, that stuff literally ties into some super sus, dangerous stuff that's going on in California that they were doing. And it's going to tie in with Jolly West. <laughs> and I've already got Margaret Singer. Margaret Singer's in New York with the Jewish Family Federation, like, revving up her anti-cult rhetoric. Because those MK doctors needed a job, right? Because remember, the Tavistock chickens are starting to come home to roost. Yeah? All that torturing of people for medicine, right? Because they're smarter than you, and they know all about psychology. Yeah? Some heroes. Some helpers. Really uh, philanthropic. Yeah? I don't think so. Didn't the Netflix doc have Detective Justice say more than once 
when he called Yonkers Dispatch by some crazy coincidence, it was Weed who answered. Well, Benjamin G., it says that over and over again in the newspapers. I don't think it's a coincidence at all, especially because Wheat Carr was one of the first police dispatchers in Yonkers. She was one of the first people to do that. And her family's answering service was already established. And I showed you guys that she was uh, involved with, like, the Knights of Columbus since high school. Whether people like it or not, that literally mean, that brings the Vatican into the chat. Period. Because that's the Catholic Church. That's part of the Catholic League. Because those types of titles, especially back then, really mattered. They put things in the newspaper because not only are they narcissistic sociopaths, in my opinion, uh, but they need to let people know their status and who, the, who they are associated with. So Wheat was getting plucked for all of that from the get-go. But her mom and Sam, a.k.a. Michael II, they also bred her into it because they were both involved in that type of activity as well. This is no longer a crazy conspiratorial thinking in regards to the son of Sam. Uh, and quite frankly, I think that anybody that, you know, wants to dismiss it in such a way and be really disrespectful about it, you're being disingenuous in my opinion, and you're running cover for something or someone. Keep it up. I'm not threatening anybody, but keep it up. Because just like I can do research on dead people, I can also do research on alive people. You know what I mean? It's not that hard. Because uh, like I said, I have nothing to lose. And, you know, I, I get crazy messages and people being really ugly to me. And, you know, I'm human. I'm human. And everybody has their breaking point. But, you know, I'm not... I'm not like a punching bag or a doormat or anything, and I don't have to put up with it. I can literally just start researching other people that are giving me major sus vibes who want to sit here and act like authorities on X, Y, or Z, or present themselves as arbiters of truth when I know for a fact that that is not the case. But I'm going to go ahead and leave this here for now because I feel like I rambled a little bit. However... Huh, we we at least corrected the record about Sam. And I feel good about that, guys, because that was really bothering me. Uh, I don't want to lie to you guys, and I don't want to hide anything. So that's it. That's my argument about Sam. Calling him Michael, too. Okay. Um, and obviously, we have a long way to go. We just have a long way to go. Um, if, by chance, there is somewhere in the Son of Sam files where Wheat's notes... If those exist, if someone wants to let me know, that would be great. Because all those handwritten notes, I, I can't sit there and look at all of it. I go cross-eyed. I just can't. Um, it's not me being lazy. I, I'm just like, Ugh, I feel like I'm going to have a stroke. But like when I smell something weird, I also think that I'm having a stroke. I'm like, is this it? Like, God, is this the one? <laughs> um Obviously, I would love to see that. I think that wheat has been treated with child gloves. You ain't getting that here. Um, and then we're going to kind of take a step back because I do want to look at the stuff with transactional analysis and what's going on in California. I also want to dig a little bit deeper with Virginia specifically about Father Sam now that I know that he's in L.A. Because now I really, really, really want to know what he was doing. Because he's not really in the papers, guys. He's not in the papers until this crap starts going on. So what the hell was he doing? Was he recruited into the Guardian's office? Because that would also make sense. Personally, I think that he was sent to uh, prepare for uh, whatever process faction was getting ready to run over there. Because you guys have to go back and look at my extensive series where we go through the court records where nobody can keep their story straight about when they're getting to New York. And now not only were they running away from California for a reason, which we have already proven with documentation, but now I see why they kind of were doing the exact same thing in New York. It's all starting to make sense, but we'll get there guys. Uh, thank you so much for being here. And we just got to keep fighting demons, y'all. So 
it is what it is, but I'm going to run the exit and I will talk to you guys very soon.